Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 69 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. My guest for this episode is Dr. Andrew Jeffrey. Andrew studied at the University of St. Andrews and has written widely on military and maritime history. He has authored a trilogy of books on Scotland's role in the Second World War, and his media work has included research and on-air contributions for British, Dutch, and French documentaries. He's also a former sea fisherman, Royal Navy reservist, and volunteer lifeboatman with the Royal National Lifeboat Institution. I invited Andrew onto the podcast after learning about and reading his most recent book, A Taste for Treason, The Letter That Smashed a Nazi Spy Ring. It's the story of how a long-established espionage network on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean was broken, all because of a single alert Scottish civilian who noticed something suspicious and followed her instincts. But before we dive into this story, I want to say a big thank you to everyone listening who is also supporting me on Patreon, including Christian W. and Frank W. Your monthly contributions there help me keep this podcast going week in and week out. As a way of thanking my patrons, I offer a lot of great freebies and promotions, including free and discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. Patrons also get exclusive access to long-form articles of mine that aren't available anywhere else. If you haven't signed up for my Patreon yet, but you want to, just click the link in the show notes on whatever podcast platform you're listening to right now. Andrew, thank you for joining me today. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear it. This is a story that I was somewhat familiar with before I read your book, but you laid out the story of the Rumrich case, the Rumrich Network, I would say, in honestly, just some tremendous detail. And I'm really glad that I had the chance to learn so much about this event that had such a lasting impact on world events, as Mm -hmm. we'll see. So can you tell me, how did you choose this particular subject as the the focus of your newest book? It goes back to many, many years ago, 30 years ago. And when I was doing the, the trilogy on Scotland's war, I came across the story of this German spy who had operated in Dundee and Scotland. But there was very little information about her. I I was then able to speak to some of the people who had been most directly involved in the case, including a a special branch officer who had been involved in the surveillance operation on her. But there were no official documents. So you really didn't know the background to Jessie, Jessie's involvement in this story at all. Since then, of course, there have been numerous releases, both in the UK and in the US, of, doc- of, of records from the period, intelligence records from the period. And we can now develop the story fully. And it, it, you know, it, it's, it's an extraordinary story that, that we are still living with the effects of to this very day. That's absolutely right. And that was something that you made really clear in the book, and I was glad to see it. And this is something that I've, I've commented on a couple of times on different episodes now, but I understand that the way that information in United Kingdom is kind of declassified and released is far more stringent than the U.S. standard, because I guess the Official Secrets Act, they tend to hold on to stuff practically forever instead of just 25 years or 50 years or what have you. So did that make your research more difficult? Did you have to wait a very long time to write this story? Yeah, it certainly, I couldn't do it back in 1988. And the files on, Hmm. for example, this case have now been released from MI5's archives. We don't have them all, but we have enough. And when you compare it with the records that have been released in the US, that's how you build the timeline of events and the fuller picture. And you get a ridiculous situation where, for example, you get a UK document with a name redacted in it. And then you look at the US documents and you find the person's name there. Now, that applies both ways, of (laughs) course, because, you know, in, in some of the US documents, there are names redacted and they either turn up in an MI5 document or, as we will see, 
in a book released by one of the FBI agents involved, which has all the names in it unredacted. So <laughs> it's all, it, you know, there's, there's, there's still paranoia around about these things, but hey ho, we just, we work our way around it. Right, right. Yeah. I, I can imagine that's a real challenge, just diving through all of these and putting pieces together from different sides of the ocean, yeah. really. And that reminds me of, I interviewed Giles Milton a few weeks ago, who I assume yes. you're familiar with. And he mentioned that a lot of stuff turned up in India that was unredacted or totally released, uh, stuff that was still covered by Official Secrets Act in Britain. So that was like a real treasure trove for some yes, of his own research. exactly. And, uh, you know, it happens all the time. Um, it just means you do have to cast the net very widely and carefully build a timeline and look for the coincidences, look for the links. And it, then it all starts, you know, serendipity all starts to come together. I love it. And I feel like I really benefited from the final product because I didn't have to spend years <laughs> researching it, but I learned it all in just a couple of weeks reading your book, which was That's great. wonderful, Thank honestly. You. And, you know, it gave me so many threads to pull on myself. You know, I was making notes of like, oh my gosh, I have to read more about this person or that person or that event. So there was just a lot of stuff I was not familiar with, especially as we're going to talk about, you know, in Europe leading up to the, the actual start of hostilities in 1939. Yeah, and I mean, uh, you know, and one fact, thing too, uh, you know, the, no book is an end in itself. And, you know, this will lead, as you say, historians on to look at other documents or find other sources and, you know, but hopefully we've got, I think we've got a pretty comprehensive picture now of what really happened with the Rumerick case and the Anglo-American relationship that sprang from it. Hmm. Yeah, that, that's good to hear. It's, I'm glad to see that there's a lot more clarity on that and, and the consequences of this one thing that was well known at the time, but probably they didn't anticipate would spin out for decades right. to come. I have to comment on the, the book's preface, honestly, was really amazing. That, that opening scenes, it was I would almost describe it as a bloodbath, really, of all the different quick um, stories and anecdotes that you provide of these various spies getting caught and jailed and in many cases executed all across Europe. I mean, just one after the other. It was really astonishing how many were being caught everywhere and, and how many were killed for their activities. Absolutely. And I mean, the first, the first opening scene in the book, in fact, takes place in Toulon in France in 1939. And that's the very end of the story in a way. You know, we, we, takes it, we go back from that into the story, but that involves a French naval officer who we will return to shortly, but involves his execution by firing squad. The, the penalties and the dangers attached to espionage, even in the 1930s, were very real. And for, and for many people, very fatal. We have in the book the story of two Polish informants who had working in the German high command in the middle 1930s and were beheaded. They were women, two women, one a typist and one a, a senior secretary, who were beheaded by a, a German executioner in Berlin the executioner was wearing a top hat and tails, would you believe? And his razor-sharp axe was kept in a bucket of ice to stop the blood flow. This was the sort of thing that was going on. And so we must never see this lightly. We never should take this lightly. It is There was real danger attached to this. Oh, yes. I, I was stunned to read that, honestly. That was not a story I was familiar with at all. But, you know, women being beheaded in Western Europe in the 1930s was was unexpected, to say the very least, honestly. But I'm, I'm glad that it was covered there because, just like you said, it drives home just how serious all of this was because, as we know now, I mean, the world went to war. This was all just a preface to all of that, and far more people died mm -hmm. once the actual conflict began. It so was, very serious stuff right from the beginning. Yeah. So, Andrew, I want to ask you, most of my listeners are from the United States, certainly not all, but most. And, you know, for us, subconsciously, at least, you know, World War II kind of begins with Pearl Harbor. And we think a lot as much about the Pacific theater as about the European theater. But I know in Europe, as your book makes really clear, you know, people were aware for years before September of 1939, that war was on the horizon. So can you just talk a little bit about that atmosphere in the, you know, the mid 1930s with Hitler rising to power and the threat of war growing? What was it like for the average citizen during that time period? Well, 
the people's reactions varied, partly according to generations, partly according to where they were. But generally, there was an atmosphere of rising tension, an atmosphere that has almost eerie parallels with what's going on today, because you had a proxy war in 1938 when this was that the, most of the book is concerned with. You had a proxy war going on in Spain, which involved, uh, it was a proxy war involving Western powers on one hand, the Western democracies on one hand, and the Soviet Union bankrolling and supporting the Bolshevik regime, the communist regime. On the other hand, war was being fought out. It was bitter. It was every bit as bitter as what's going on currently in Ukraine. You have all of this going on. You have a rising military power. Now, some people, the, the reactions to all of this were mixed. Some people, seeing what was going on in Spain, viewed a powerful Germany as a bulwark against an aggressive and expansionist Soviet Union in the 1930s. Some people saw, thought that way. We mention a few of them in the book on, on, on the right of politics. On the left, reactions, of course, were very different. It's it, it, you know, the Treaty of Versailles was often is widely blamed for what went wrong in the 1930s, the rise of the Nazis and the 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 war that followed it. That's quite wrong. It, Versailles was not, was a handy excuse for the rise of the Nazis. It, it wasn't the cause of the rise of the Nazis. The Treaty of Versailles was actually quite mild com compared with what was done to Germany in 1945, for example. But the, the, there was this general rising tension. The wider, most people, most ordinary people in Europe then and to an extent to, to, today, have a naturally pacifist bent. They, 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 they don't want war. Nobody wants war. They were placing a lot of faith in, for example, hyperactive politicians like Neville Chamberlain rushing over to Germany and coming back with a bit of paper, roughly at the time the action in this book takes place. And Chamberlain, of course, was a very poor judge of character, but shall we say, yes. uh, at the very least. And some people might say also rather arrogant, you know, with his, with his belief in his own abilities. However, there we go. That didn't work very well, although it did. It is often credited with gaining the Western powers or the allies in the Second World War a few months more to prepare for it. I don't think that's true at all. I don't think Hitler was ready for war in 1938 any more than the allies. Were. But yes, I mean, generation gaps for the older people, for example, we bring it up in the book where RAF air shows, you have the RAF being asked not to show overtly aggressive air displays, i.e. bombing and strafing, but pretty aerobatics were fine. Hmm. So in other words, the RAF's real purpose was to be kept secret from or kept away from the public because it might inspire a warlike thinking. It was it was pretty silly, really. But yeah, just this general atmosphere of rising tension centered on what was going on at the time in Europe which, as I say, bears uncanny resemblance to what is going on today, a worrying resemblance to what is going on today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can certainly see that. So taking it back, like as I mentioned in the introduction, this enormous kind of globe-spanning conspiracy, it all kind of began with this woman in Scotland, this alert woman in Scotland. So can you talk about that a little bit? Because that's a, a really fascinating intro as well, I think. How did that exactly start with this alert landlady? Well, it, it actually goes a little further back than that. It begins with a former airman, a British airman called Christopher Draper, also known as the Mad Major, who was a World War I air race, air ace. And in the 1930s, he was a rather down at heel bit part actor. And he dreamt up a scheme to smuggle gold out of the, of the Labrador gold fields. He would set up an air taxi service in Labrador and the miners would be encouraged to tip the pilot with a few choice nuggets. And there would be a, a steam yacht stationed offshore to make off with the loot. Now, the one thing that Draper and his associates, one of whom was in the US, was, lacked was the money to set this up. So they came up with this scheme that Draper, as an ex-flyer, flyer, would 
approached the Germans and offer his services as a spy. And from this, he would be able to make some money, which they would then use to finance the gold scheme, the gold smuggling scheme. You couldn't make this stuff up, honestly. Anyway, the, the, the Draper did eventually go to Germany on two occasions, one of which he met Hitler at Munich Airport, and we have a photograph of that rather uninspiring meeting in the book. And he uh, and was uh, eventually, he, met, he was taken to Hamburg, where he met a spymaster in a cafe. The spymaster is sitting with the sun behind him. He's wearing a trilby hat dark glasses and a trench coat, honestly. And he, this spymaster, German spymaster, made it clear to Draper that payment would be by results and would be rather meagre. So when Draper came back to the UK, he realised that this was a non-starter and confessed all to MI5, who then ran him as a double agent now, one of the address, a double agent, incidentally, whom they never, the British never trusted because he of his previous dalliance with espionage. Mm-hmm. So it, it, one of the addresses that the Hamburg spymaster had given Draper to send his intelligence to was P.O. Box 629 Hamburg. Now, they ran Draper and they sent intelligence, MI5 sent intelligence to this address for several months until they ran out of basically ran out of plausible falsehoods that they could give the Germans. You know, nobody there was nothing left to say you know, that was could possibly pass as chicken feed intelligence. So and Draper was allowed to keep the the odd five pounds that he was sent by the the Germans, which he was very grateful for. And then they, they kind of petered out basically because both sides lost interest. But PO Box 629 Hamburg had by then been added to an MI5 intercept list. In other words, MI5 had gone to the Home Office here in the UK and had said to them that they wanted to stop all mail leaving the UK to PO Box 629 Hamburg because this was a known German intelligence address. They were given what is known as a Home Office warrant. And then the Post Office and it was postmen were were employed to spot these letters before they left the UK, and they would then be intercepted, and they would then be opened and photographed, and then sent on their way, of course. Um, Now, in in the the, this 629, PO Box 629, would come back to haunt the German intelligence very shortly, because in the meantime, they had dispatched to Scotland, this woman, Jessie Jordan, to a former Hamburg hairdresser to to act as principally a letter letter drop, a break in the communication between Abwehr agents, that's agents of the German intelligence service, Abwehr, in the United States and their spy masters in Germany. She was to receive the mail from the US, she would then put it into another envelope and send it on to Germany. Now, the Jesse Jordan arrived in Scotland in the autumn of 1937. She was a fascinating character. She had an extraordinary background. She was actually a Scots born. She was the illegitimate daughter of a housemaid, a Scottish housemaid. And she had a very unpleasant upbringing, uh, in very straitened circumstances in Scotland. And in 1912, she met, in 1907, sorry, she met a German waiter in a hotel in in, 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 here in Dundee in Scotland. His name was Friedrich Jordan. This man, this waiter was visibly distressed when she met him and she helped him out because it turned out he was clutching a telegram telling him Friedrich Jordan, that his brother had been killed in an accident in London. So Jesse made sure this man got on the right train to London and they kept in touch. A romance blossomed. And in 1912, Jesse went to Germany, married her German waiter and set up home in Hamburg. Now, she remained in Germany right through the First World War. Um, 
ironically with very few friends because she was a Brit in Germany, a Brit born in Germany, although she had that time German nationality. She had very few friends, ironically, because everyone thought she was a British spy. But she was nothing of the sort, of course. Her husband had been called up into the German army at the outbreak of war, leaving Jessie and their young daughter, Margaretha, in Hamburg. And her uh, the husband, Fritz Jordan, she was not really actually Jesse Jordan, she was Jesse Jordan, but that was that's the correct pronunciation. But it's become anglified, if you like, because she was in Scotland. But she, her husband survived four years of trench warfare, only to die in 1918, an early victim of the f- influenza pandemic oh, wow. that swept around the world in the very tail end in the aftermath of the war and actually killed many millions more than the actual war did. That's often forgotten. The two events, the pandemic and the war, have become conflated. That that sense of overarching grief became conflated in the years after the war. But Jesse remained in Germany right through the First World War, as I say. And again, after the war, she set up in business as a hairdresser, and she was very successful. She eventually ended up with three shops in Hamburg, um, and was doing very well. She had a very nice life. Her daughter had grown up to be a talented singer and had a potentially a good theatrical career ahead of her. And she had adopted the son of a friend as well along the way. She had a very nice life. They were living in a nice part of of, of Hamburg, and they um, had quite a, 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 a good living standard as well. Then a number of things happened. First of all, the the Nazis came to power, and because Jessie was illegitimate, she could not prove that she was of Aryan descent, and nor could her daughter prove that Hmm. she was of Aryan descent either. So neither of them were in a position to really work. On top of that, the daughter had married and had a, a, a little girl of her own. She'd married very young had a little girl of her own and had then suffered from postnatal depression only for, well, then when she was suffering from this postnatal depression, her one of uh, Jesse's friends suggested that they call in a Greek hypnotist who was apparently very good at these things, dealing with these things. They were, she, the, the hypnotist and Marga did in fact work very hard at the postnatal depression, so much so that uh, Mar- uh, Marga, the daughter's husband, came home to find said hypnotist and Marga in bed. So that was the end of her daughter's marriage. And the, uh, there were a number of other things went wrong. Most of her, most of Jessie's Jewish customers, for example, vanished. So Jessie was in a real financial trouble by the 1937, the beginning of 1937. She was in real financial trouble. She was vulnerable. Now, she decided after much toing and froing, that she would return to Scotland, track down her father, and prove both her and her daughter's Aryan descent. At least that would rescue her daughter's career. This got to the ear of one of her friends, and a, this friend of a husband who worked for the German intelligence service, Abwehr, at their outstation in Hamburg. Jesse was approached. There are various accounts of how this happened, not uh, most of which I think are pretty unreliable, but she was approached and she was asked to do some mild, es- what was classed as low-grade espionage for them, in, in, for, for the Germans in Britain. Why was she, it's, clear, it's not clear why they, they would think Jessie would make a, a good agent. She had absolutely no military skills. None at all. She had no political awareness to speak of. Very naive. So, you know, what, what, what did the Germans expect her to do? Well, it was primarily this male cutout role between agents in the US and their spy masters in Hamburg. That didn't mean she wasn't going to be doing some little bit of exp- espionage on her own that she would be instructed to do by Hamburg. But her primary role was this of the male cutout. Okay, I see. So how does that work exactly? She simply retrieves mail and and sends it off elsewhere? Well, the the agent in, in, say, in the US or elsewhere in Europe, for example, would send a letter to German, to Jesse, 
um, in Scotland, Jesse would then would then put this mail, which he knew was it was it was often air mail, for example, would she knew was meant for Hamburg. She would put this into another envelope. She would then post it off from Scotland to Germany. So it was a break in the communication mm-hmm. between the agent and the spy master. But there was somebody else in the middle, arguably somebody who's probably just a sacrificial lamb. Mm-hmm. But there we go. That was Jessie's primary role. She did also get involved in other things, however. She 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 is certainly known to have sketched military uh, installations. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But she's certainly noticed it sketched military installations in Scotland. And the, in the meantime, of course, she'd arrived here in Dundee with the intention of taking over hairdresser shop here because she'd gone to she'd traveled around Scotland trying to track down her natural father and prove her Aryan descent to the satisfaction of the Nazi authorities. But well, perhaps unsurprisingly, her natural father proved very hard to track down. In fact, there is some evidence he disappeared to the United States. So she had failed in that. So she came up with plan B. And plan B was to operate this hairdresser shop in Scotland and then bring her daughter over here and the family would set up home in Scotland. She eventually spotted an advert in a local Scottish newspaper here in Dundee for a hairdressing shop in Kinloch Street, number one Kinloch Street. It's a very much a working class area of the city then and now and then quite a poor working class area of the city. Yet Jessie went to some lengths to get this shop and she turned up at the door of a woman called Mary Curran. Now, Mary worked in the shop, worked in the hairdressing salon. It was owned by her brother-in-law, in fact. And she worked in there and Mary was used and her husband, John, were used as the go-betweens in the negotiations between Jessie and Mary's brother-in-law over the buying of the shop. And eventually the business changed hands. From the very start, from the moment that Mary very first clapped eyes on Jessie Jordan, when she called at her flat in Dundee back in 1937, she she was convinced there was something not quite right about Jessie. It just, there was something that didn't make sense about her. There was this very glamorously dressed. Jessie was always immaculately turned out hair all done, blonde hair, all immaculately done. She was, as I say, also immaculate. And she stuck out in this very working class area of the city like a sore thumb. She was something of an oddball in the area. But she did take over this hairdressing salon, a rundown business, as I say, in a very poor area, and immediately began spending extraordinary sums of money on it. The whole place was redecorated. The latest hairdressing equipment appeared from Germany. Hmm. All of this started Mary asking questions like, what's going on here? This makes no sense at all. And she used to say to her husband, John, who was a Dundee tramway conductor, she used to say to him, you know, I'm sure that woman could be a spy. I could say that in the Dundee accent, but nobody would understand it. But, you know, it's, she used to say, I'm sure that woman's a spy. And her husband used to say, don't be silly. You know, what's there to spy on in Dundee? It's not a military city. There's nothing here worth spying on. What on earth would the Germans send a spy here for? But Mary was not, was not going to be deterred from this. And she started to see things that made no sense. The first thing she came across one day, she used to be cleaner in the shop, amongst other things, and in the salon. And the first thing she came across, screwed up a bit of paper under the counter, and on it was the word Zeppelin. And 24 numerals. Now, the word Zeppelin meant one thing to people in the 1930s in the UK, and that was air raids. Hmm. That immediately came to mind. Now, don't forget also that Mary's of a generation brought up under the shadow of the First World War. They, they, you know, they, they, they had also been brought up on a diet of movies like, well, only recently before Jesse arrived, 
the the 39 steps with Richard Hanney battling German agents across the Scottish moorland and, and the Four Frail Bridge. So, you know, they'd seen all this and they'd lived with the aftermath of the First World War. So there was a natural suspicion mm-hmm. in any case. But when Jessie saw this piece of paper with the word Zeppelin on it, she showed it. She, she decided she had to get it home. And the way she got it home was to stuff it down the front of her dress. <laughs> and she took it home and she showed it to her husband. And he said, oh, don't be silly. You know, that's, that's no, you know, that, you can't, you know, don't be silly. There's nothing to spy on here in Dundee. But Mary made him take, and this is where we get to spy catching Scottish style, <laughs> because that Mary ta- made him take it to his boss in the tramway garage. The boss in the tramway garage took one look at this and went, oh, don't be silly. This is, this is nonsense. She's not a spy. There's nothing to spy on in Dundee. Don't be silly. Tell Mary she'd been reading too many novels and gave him the bit of paper back. Mary put it back in the shop. And, and then, shortly after that, Jessie slipped one day and sprained her ankle and was unable to get to work. So they, so they opened the shop that day, opened the salon that day, and took the opportunity to rifle Jessie's handbag, <laughs> which was sitting on a table in the shop. And in amongst the handbag, amongst other stuff, she found, it was a large handbag, she found a general a, a, a map of Scotland with marked on it military installations on the east coast, airfields, barrack blocks, and the like. So this, well, as far as Mary's concerned, was proof positive. She'd been right all along. So she took it home. So she again this went down the front of her dress. She took it home. It was photographed by the police who were immediately convinced incidentally it previously it had gone back to the it first made its way to the tramway garage inspector in other words her husband's boss who then took it to the to the police who realized this was serious photographed it and then the map was hastily replaced that same night into jesse's handbag in the shop the map was then taken to mi5 the following day and when the Dundee police officer, with a copy of the photograph of the map, arrived in London with this and took it to MI5. The MI5 officer, Edward Hinchley Cook, said, Ah, that'll be Mrs. Jordan. We know about her. Hmm. They knew about her because she'd previously sent a letter to P.O. Box 629 Hamburg. And that letter had contained some very amateurish intelligence about the the, the the garrison town of Aldershot in the south of England. Very amateurish. It was completely worthless. Mm. And, you you know, you'd have got more for buying a local street directory in a stationer's shop. So it was, it was just rubbish. But it did go to this address in Hamburg. And as Jessie was at the time living in Perth, when she sent this, they also had reused a letter that had previously been sent to her, an envelope rather, that had previously been sent to her in Perth, on which the address was still legible. Oh, wow. Jessie's own address was still legible on this letter that she sent to Hamburg. So not only did they get the fact that Jessie was in contact with them, they got this address in Perth, and they knew about Jesse living in Perth. Were it not, however, for Mary Curran alerting the police in Dundee to this map, MI5 would not have known about the hairdressing salon in Scotland. And that's the limitation of using mail intercept for surveillance. Hmm. It's only limited to one address. Oh, wow. Boy, what a story there. What a turn. The smallest little tradecraft mistake with reusing that same envelope combined with the, the nosy landlady who trusted her instincts, which turned out to be accurate. And it's that's the start of something enormous. That really is amazing. Extraordinary. It's extraordinary. Truly. And the, and the fact that Mary, as we will see, the fact that Mary alerted the police when she did was just in the nick of time, as we'll, ter- as we'll see when we come to discuss 
further international ramifications of the case. But what did happen immediately was that the, the, the male intercept, which was put in place right away on Jordan's salon at 1 Kinloch Street, Dundee, the male intercept on that began turning up letters from an, a, a, an advert agent in the US, an agent who was posting his correspondence more, most often from the Bronx Central Annex, and he was signing these letters to Abwehr as just Crown. He was using the code name Crown. They were all neatly typed letters, very neatly typed. They were, and they were very well set out. And just this one word at the end, either Herr Kron or Crown, if it was in English. Now, these letters initially um, were allowed to proceed. They were steamed open in a post office in Dundee by a man called Alexander Jack. He was armed with a sharp knife, a kettle and a camera. This is how mail interception was done. Local postman. And he steamed these letters open, pho photographed them and sent the film off down to London, where it was passed to MI5. Now, the first of these letters that came forward in the intercept on Kinloch Street were fairly innocuous. They didn't really say very much. In fact, they gave the impression that Agent Crown was trying to make himself look busier than he actually was. Hmm. And then there was a, a, a completely lunatic letter which spoke of forging the forging White House stationery uh, and, the, and the signature of President Roosevelt and using that to get the drawings, the construction drawings, of the latest U.S. Navy aircraft carriers, Enterprise and Yorktown, brand new ships that were just being launched and would go on to play a major part in the war. But the, the this plan was, you know, it was so obviously far-fetched that MI5 just decided at the present time, for the present, to keep just a watching brief and see where this led, rather than try and start a, a major international hunt for the man, because... You know, it was so crazy what this man was proposing to do, what Agent Crown was supposing to do, and was being revealed by the letters intercepted in Scotland. It was so obviously crazy that, you know, it, it, it just seemed insane. Yeah, I guess he Until, wasn't that much of a threat if he was trying these things that would never work in the first place. Yeah, I mean, it was laughable. You know, it was pretty laughable. Until the 28th of January, 1938, when it's a Friday, Alexander Jack's kettle's on the boil again. This time, it's another letter from Agent Crown. And it is, it describes this letter. It is photographed and the, the film is sent off to London. It's, it it uh, is developed in the Mount Pleasant sorting office in London and then couriered to MI5. The duty officer at MI5, this is a Saturday morning, the duty officer at MI5 takes one look at this and sees that it describes the plot, a plot by Agent Crown to lure an American army officer, Colonel Henry Eglin, to a bogus staff meeting in New York Hotel. There, Crown and his accomplices were to overpower this man, the Colonel Eglin, and relieve him of mobilization instructions for the part of the eastern seaboard of the U.S. Now, this cha this letter changed everything because basic, and this was due to happen within a few days, and this letter changed everything because now, potentially at least, if this did go ahead, a man's be injured or worse. Mm -hmm. So the the decision was taken in MI5, and it was taken at the top level because the director of MI5, Sir Vernon Cal. And his German specialist, his counter-espionage specialist for Germany, Edward Hensley Cook, sought a meeting that same afternoon with the with the with the US military attache, Colonel Raymond Lee, and the embassy in London, and handed him a memo outlining what was in the letter. And he could pass this information on to Washington with immediate effect, with one proviso one strict proviso, and that was to be that the information that Lee had been given 
the source of that information must never be divulged. It must never be divulged that it came from MI5 or even indeed from Britain. The MI5 wanted to protect their sources. Natural, all intelligence services do. Mm-hmm. So this is this is what happened. The letter, the, the, there were coded signals that Saturday evening to Washington. Colonel Lee apparently had some difficulty con- convincing his, his colleagues in New York and in, in Washington rather that that this was actually serious. But he did manage to convince them that it come from a very good source, an unimpeachable source, and that that Colonel Eglin should be warned as a matter of urgency. Eglin was indeed warned. And then on the Sunday, that's less than 48 hours after Sandy Jack had boiled his kettle in Dundee and steamed open this Agent Crown letter, a meeting convened in the FBI field office in the Justice Building in Foley Square, New York. And the the, the hunt for Agent Crown began. Hmm. Yeah, that, that was an incredible plot. I mean, like you said, the first plot with the White House letterhead was foolhardy, but this was... This was on another level entirely, this forcibly relieving this colonel of the paperwork and injuring or potentially killing him. Because I don't I don't recall off the top of my head hardly any cases like that happening, especially not in the United States where somebody is is violently attacked in order to steal intelligence off of their person. So I'm I'm really glad that the MI five decided to reach out because that really spurned this whole enormous investigation and everything that came afterwards. I want to tell you all about my new favorite fragrance for daily wear. It's called Novichok by Clandestine Laboratories. Novichok is distinctive and combines notes of cocoa powder, chocolate almond tort, rose, jasmine, cinnamon, tonka bean, Peru balsam, and musk tonkin. Unlike some of the other colognes I've worn in the past, I found that Novichok stays with me all day, which was a pleasant surprise. If the name sounds familiar to you, then you might already know why I was so happy to find this company and support them. The name itself comes from the very well-known Russian nerve agent Novichok, which has been used in recent years in several assassination attempts, which I've covered here on the podcast in previous episodes. The name is spelled differently, but rest assured, once you put this on, you'll still make a killer impression wherever you go. Novichok is made in small batches by clandestine laboratories and, like their entire lineup, is available only via direct order. If you're not sure which of their fragrances is right for you, you can also check out the Discovery Stash. Six different mini bottles at one great price, which is perfect for finding your signature scent. So make sure to check them out either via a link in the show notes of this episode or at their website, clandestinelaboratories.com or on Instagram at clandestinelaboratories. So at this point, they didn't know Crown's name yet, did they? No, they didn't know who Crown was. In fact, they had nothing to go on apart from what little had come in from MI5. And MI5 weren't actually giving away all they knew, as we will see. They they knew a bit more about Crown than they actually they, 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 they actually let on to Colonel Lee. But their motive was to stop the attack on this on this army officer, US Army officer, Colonel Eglin. The it became apparent after this that there were that this actually opened up an opportunity because MI5 had been passing intelligence to the Americans principally about Soviet agents now this had been done through over the during the 1930s this had been done on this a piecemeal basis when something came up that was relevant they would pass it to the embassy in London it would be suitably disguised the source would be covered and so on but it would be passed to the embassy in London. That intelligence would then go through diplomatic channels to the State Department. And that's where it came to an end. That's where the chain came to an end because the state, because state, like all diplomats, hate espionage and they hate the the sort of the, the, the upset that this can cause, the ripples that this can cause in international relationships. And that they had a tendency to do nothing with the intelligence that was being passed on from Britain, simply bury it. What this case did opened up an opportunity for a direct link between MI5 and the FBI. And that's 
what happened within a matter of weeks of that letter being intercepted. They will come back to that, if you like, because we're getting slightly ahead of ourselves <laughs> here. The initial investigation by the by the FBI was there a little more information came forward from London, and the the, the FBI got onto it. But it was the FBI was this, uh, it was a crime fighting organization. It was about it was all about investigating crime. It was not an organization that was well suited to the subtleties of counter espionage. And it did tend to get a bit ham fisted at times on this one. But what happened was that they were, after that initial meeting in, in the Justice Building in New York at the FBI, the, the, there was very little to go on until they were really forced to wait until Crown made a mistake or revealed something about himself, either in a letter to Dundee or in another set of circumstances that, that, uh, that identified him. And they didn't have long to wait because a couple of weeks after that letter was intercepted in Dundee and passed, and the gist of it passed to Washington and New York, then the 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 the, the, the passport office in New York got a very very odd phone call from somebody claiming to be Cordell Hull, the Secretary of State, and asking for uh, blank passport forms to be sent to him at an hotel in New York. Now, the passport office smelt a rat, mainly because just very shortly before that, there had been a, a major case of passport uh, fraud involving a Soviet agent, which is we'll not go into, but uh, <laughs> fascinating in itself. But anyway, this, this, the, the passport office was suspicious. This, they alerted, of course, agents of the State Department who laid a trap for this so-called Cordell Hull, and I eventually caught the man outside a bar in New York trying to claim these passport forms in a kind of a roundabout. There was a chase all around the streets of New York involving the Western Union and all sorts of other things. Fascinating stuff. They got him outside this bar. When they searched his briefcase, this Cordell Hull, who actually had by then identified himself as Gunter Rumrich, this, when they searched his briefcase, they found this very odd letter which referred to a plot to lure Colonel Eglin to a New York hotel for a bogus staff meeting. So they called in G2, military intelligence, and the, the military intelligence officers made the connection immediately between this letter that they found on this Gunter Rumrich, i.e. the man who posed as Cordell Hall, and the letter that had been intercepted in Dundee and the intelligence that had come across the Atlantic from Colonel Lee. So it turned out that this Gunter Rumrich was, in fact, Agent Crown. That's how they identified him. And from there, they interrogated him. Now, he was the, the, the FBI were first very reluctant to take the case on because there was, there was a leak to the press. Unsurprisingly, it happens everywhere, <laughs> right, of course. as we know. There was a leak to the press. It was either a State Department agent or an NYPD detective had leaked this to the press and the story had got into the papers about this man who'd been arrested and a link to espionage. So the FBI were at first reluctant to take it on because as Director Hoover quite rightly said, you know, this has warned off anyone that was likely to have been caught up in this. They've either covered their tracks or they've, or they've disappeared. But eventually, military intelligence, they persisted. And they, they persisted to the point that the FBI were reluctantly forced to take it on initially. And the head of the FBI field office in New York, Reed Vetterly, he, the special agent in charge, he, he delegated the case to a multilingual special agent in the New York field office by the name of Leon Trump, a man who plays a very central part in the events that followed. A fascinating character he was. He was born in what is now Russia, but he was uh, what was then Russia, rather. It is now Poland. He had a he had a gave, he gave several versions, all of them very different about his background. And frankly, few of them have bear much examination, to be honest. In fact, just recently, I was talking to another historian about him, and and we sort of we sort of likened him to a pound shop, Sidney Riley, because you know the the Ace of Spies, mm -hmm. because he had this 
extraordinary, you know, cover up of his background, basically. He just, he, he was, he was a bit of a crook. He, we do know that he had been involved in smuggling, but he worked his way into the FBI by a roundabout route. And he, because he spoke many languages, he was, of course, very useful to the Bureau. And he found himself landed with the interrogation of Agent Crown. Now, Crown at first would say very little. He, you know, he'd, or uh, Rumrich, as is to give him his proper name, would say at first very little. But as days passed, his and he found himself just sitting there, and none of his friends or acquaintances, or none of the the, the German intelligence uh, or German diplomats had come to his rescue. Nobody had come to his rescue. His his morale was visibly sinking, and eventually, Taru persuaded him to talk, and he talked. He sang like a bird. And he named a number of different people, including the courier on and the couriers rather on the Atlantic German liner that he was communicating with to his German spy master through. And one of those couriers was subsequently arrested as she stepped ashore in New York when that liner, the Europa, next called at New York. This was a woman called Johanna Hoffmann. And she too sang like a bird after a while, and she she named a number of other people, including a New York doctor, a New York medical doctor by the name of Ignaz Griebel. He, Griebel, had earlier been heavily involved with a German aviation spy in the US by the name of Willem Kosky, and had helped this, this man to escape to Canada when he was coming under investigation. Now Griebel was, had taken over the ring that Lonkowski left behind him. Um, and it's hard to think of anyone less well-placed to run a spy network than Ignaz Theodor Griebel, MD. The man was a notorious anti-Semite who had bizarrely at one rally in Madison Square Garden yelled out, Heil Hitler, Heil President Roosevelt. I'm not sure what FDR made of that, but anyway. <laughs> right. <laughs> but or or for that matter, Adolf Hitler made of that. But yeah, this was he was he was much given to things like that. He com- he started a riot in New York in New York, New Jersey, with uh, between himself and 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 his supporters and some Jewish people in the in the area, and a riot that ended up with 200 police involved, and oh, it was, it was a shamble at the Schwabenhalle in, in New York, New Jersey. And he also was a bit of a con man. He found himself in court in New York, charged with fraud by a woman whom he had promised to marry after, after divorcing his wife, his appalling shrewish wife, Maria, who was another vile Nazi, and, and defrauding the said, the, the aggrieved woman of a painting worth five, $1,500. It, you know, this man was scarcely ever out of the newspapers, but yet I've there recruited him to run their New York spy ring. It's a it beggar's belief that they did this, but they did. And he, he took up a number of minor informants, basically, ethnic Germans who had emigrated to the US after the First World War, having been somewhat embittered by defeat in that war. And frankly, his ring produced chicken feed, (laughs) worthless intelligence, not a thing that went forward from the Griebel ring to to Germany had any tactical or strategic value whatsoever. Nothing. Hmm. But he he managed to get some quite a bit of money out of Abwehr in the in the process, but yeah that that's that was the start of the the the, the, the investigation. It, it sort of it, it went kind of wrong. It didn't go as well as it should have done. It was handled a bit, as I said, somewhat ham fisted. And Griebel was given his freedom in return for acting as state's evidence, you know, evidence for the prosecution. And proceeded then to, after he had been arrested, he proceeded then to, to name a whole host of accomplices, most of whom had nothing whatsoever to do with the spy ring, 
had been approached and had absolutely refused to get involved, some of them. Others who were merely in it to try and see how much money they could get Grievel to give them, including a draftsman at Newport News, Naval Dockyard, who was never going to pass over any intelligence, never had any to pass over, but was merely interested in getting what money he could get out of Grievel. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just, it was laughably inept stuff. But Liebel, Grievel, was working very closely with a courier, this courier, Karl Schluter, who worked on a German Atlantic liner. Schluter was described even by his own spy master in Germany as a loose cannon, to say the very least. Schluter was just a merchant, and he, was, he wasn't a very clever merchant seaman, it has to be said, hmm. and a very junior merchant seaman, and not a very clever sailor or agent at all. There's a saying on this side of the Atlantic, as thick as two short planks, which could be readily applied to Schluter. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but yeah, he, Schluter, had an overinflated idea of his own use to uh, usefulness to Abwehr and his own ability as a spy master. And he had basically recruited and taken on Gunther Rum as an agent. And he was the one that was coming up with these ideas like the White House stationery that had been detected in this letter that had been intercepted in Dundee. Um, unfortunately, the FBI missed Schluter because for some reason Schluter did not ever again appear in New York because I think he'd been warmed off or I think he suspected something was wrong and he didn't turn up. Mm -hmm. They all they got was this woman, Johanna Hoffman, who led them on to Grievel. Right, there was a the large... It was the Grievel Ring, yeah. Yeah, the, the Grievel Ring that was large. I think it was 14 people were accused, but only a few of them actually went on trial in the end. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it, it was very few of them because, of course, quite a few of those were, uh, who were on the, on the federal grand jury indictment were actually in Germany. So they weren't going to turn up for trial. Two had escaped. Grebel made his escape. He stored away across, uh, 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 aboard a... a, a, a a German liner, the Bremen, and New York Harbour. He actually abandoned his wife sitting in his car, and his wife Maria couldn't drive, so she had to phone, phone a, a chauffeur to come and take her home <laughs> dead of night because she was stuck down by the docks, you know. And her husband had just vanished, and he did. He vanished. He reappeared in Germany later, but he, he vanished. Um, didn't he? If I remember another... correctly, Andrew, didn't he say, "I just have to go onto the ship for a moment to meet someone." And he got on the yeah, ship and it yeah, just left, yeah, yeah. left his wife I'll on the I'll be back in a minute, yeah. Yes, Maria, I'll be back in a minute. Don't worry, oh see ya. And it's boom, gone. Anyway. That's, I mean, that's terrible and to laugh the, at it, but it's funny years later, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it's, it is. It's laughable, most mm -hmm. of it. And then one of the other agents in the Grebel Ring, he managed to escape in a similar fashion. And then, of course, one of the others named on the indictment, that was, that was Jesse Jordan. And, of course, by then, with the FBI case having reached the press in the US, as it very quickly did, and the arrests of Grebel and the, and, and the other agents in the US, as, as soon as that hit the press, MI5, and, and it became apparent as well that MI5 had been the source of the information, MI5 were furious, it has to be said, because their source had been blown. <laughs> and on top of that, they now had no choice but to move in and arrest Jesse Jordan, which they did in Dundee in March 1938, just as the American case hit the press, so Jesse Jordan was arrested. So that meant that Jesse was by then, by the time the federal grand jury indictment was, was handed down, the, then Jesse was, of course, in jail in Scotland, in Edinburgh. So she couldn't turn up for trial either. There was at one point some thought that she might be taken across the Atlantic to give evidence, but MI5 quickly put the hems on that it was never going to happen. So, yeah, MI5 were justly irritated by the fact that this had happened and that they'd been so clumsily handled and so easily revealed to the press because that destroyed their surveillance operation on this letter, this letter as intercept surveillance operation happening in Dundee. Mm -hmm. And by then, elsewhere in the UK, because they'd found, they'd found other linked agents by that time. One of whom was a woman called Ilse Duncombe, and a very sad character, who committed suicide while being interrogated by MI5. 
and she did so by overdosing on aspirin. And it took her three days to die in agony as multiple organ failure. Hmm. So, you know, again, although we can laugh about Griebel jumping on the liner, bye dear, on, we can laugh about that. On the other hand, you know, it wasn't all a bundle of laughs, not by any any stretch of the imagination. Oh, I know. That's like the only lighthearted moment in the book or what I took to be a lighthearted moment. Everything else is, is very mm. sad and tragic, quite frankly, what happened to everyone mm. involved on, mm. on both sides in a way. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it was. But yeah, the, 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 the trial duly took place in the US as well. And if the, 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 the various sentences were handed down to, it was all very dramatic, of course. Johanna Hoffmann making a plea for mercy, hyperventilating and in tears and speaking in a terribly, terribly quiet voice. A very well rehearsed performance before the judge who was taken in by it, it has to be said, to some degree. But they were all those that were on trial. The four that finally went for trial were sentenced to various sentences in jail. Now, meanwhile, the worst was to come for MI5 because Leon Thoreau, the FBI agent who had been in charge of the investigation, promptly, as soon as the indictment was handed down, Tarot had promptly resigned from the bureau. That that within hours of it happening, he resigned from the bureau, and then within the hours of that happening, it, it, it was re, it was revealed that he had signed contract with the New York Post. <laughs> He'd sold the story to the New York Post. Worst was to come. Because immediately after that, it became apparent they'd also signed a contract with Random House to do a book on the case. And worse still, he'd signed a contract with Warner Brothers to make a movie of this <laughs> story. So it, what is obvious here is that just as Ignaz Griebel was plotting his escape from justice, I leap in the board the liner and abandoning his wife. Tarot was also planning his escape from the F from the bureau from mm -hmm. the FBI because you don't negotiate book, film, book, movie, and newspaper contracts in quick succession within twenty four hours. This had been planned well in advance. He knew he was on his way out as soon as this indictment was handed down, and he was on a big payday. And it was a big payday. He met a lot of money. And he told the full story of the case in the in, in, in his book, in the New York Post articles, which were delayed till after the trial. And then in the movie. And it was the movie. The book was a bestseller. But it was the movie that went global, really. And uh, the, the, it, it it was it was it was start, it was filmed. Oh, it was all very dramatic. It was filmed behind locked doors on a locked sound stage. There, there was negotiations with the production code administration over the script because they didn't want to upset, you know, the German regime. Not yet, anyway. And there was, you know, there were edicts in place on that. And they, that, that, but it, it, it went into production it, very quickly in January 1939, just a matter of weeks after the, the end of the trial, it went into production in Hollywood. The star was Edward G., Edward G. Robinson, of course, a Romanian-born Jew, and, and other actors in the film were all either of Jewish extraction or, or indeed members of the Hollywood Anti-Nazi League. There is, a, uh, there is a, a great quote from Groucho Marx, who refers to Warner Brothers at this time as the only studio with any spine to take on the Nazis. And yes, they, they were. But they had motivation, of course, to do this, because both Jack and Harry Warner were Jewish themselves. They could see what was going on in Germany. Their own business interests in Germany had been attacked, and their personnel in Germany had been subject to Nazi Nazi intimidation, and they had basically withdrawn from Germany by this time. And they, they, so they, they had a strong motive themselves as members of the Hollywood Anti-Nazi League to, 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 to produce this film, which they did. Now, the film sticks closely to the book, it, to Taru's book, apart from 
a few bits that have been added in for dramatic effect and are actually really jarring. If you watch the film, they, these bits where you have Gestapo agents parading around in trench coats and fedora hats around the, the fog, foggy streets of New York at dead of night, killing and kidnapping Will. This sort of thing is, is you know, it, it jars. Mm-hmm. The, also, the, 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 there are marginally effective scenes with a Goebbels-like figure giving, you know, giving instructions to officers and, and, and senior intelligence officers in Berlin in, you know, suitably vast buildings and so on. Mm-hmm. It was all very, you know, it was very much of its time. These bits that are added in jar, but the rest of it, the scenes involving the Grievel character who was renamed Castle for the film, because they weren't allowed to use the original character's names, but this, the scenes with him, and they're very faithfully rendered. Very faithful, the, according to the book, and according to the also the, the coverage of these events contemporary with them you know, at the time. So, you know, the film is in places a very good, the movie is a, a very good representation of what happened. There are just these bits in it that have been added in for dramatic effect, which kind of upset a lot of people, not least the German consul in, in Los Angeles, who roundly condemned in most anti-Semitic terms, Griebel, the, the Warner Brothers rather, and Robinson and, and other stars in the film in the movie, it was it created a bit of a sensation when it came out. It really did. It infuriated the Brits. It infuriated the five, at least, the British intelligence community, because it revealed, right in the opening scene, the intercept, the letters issue, the letter interception issue. And uh, although it, it did replace grimy industrial Dundee with a, a village set that looks as though it should have been in Brigadoon. You know, it was, it was quite ridiculous. But anyway, this, this, nevertheless, it did reveal this to the cinema going public. So it, that was caused an absolute fury, fury in London, as did Tarot's book and the New, New York Times and New York Post articles. And it also, of course, earned the lasting enmity of director Hoover, who was furious that Tarot had they betrayed effectively the oath that the agents took, bureau agents took, not to go to the press with their stories, not to sell their stories to the press. Frankly, Hoover liked to do that himself. Right, I was going to say another story. Finished him, which was the worst crime of all. <laughs> yeah, probably. yeah, yeah, really, because in mean, Hoover liked to be the center of these stories, mm-hmm. and of course, this time it was Leon Trous appearing in all the photographs with Edward G and the rest of it. So this movie went around the world. It had a mixed reception. Of course, some countries would refuse to show it because it was so inflammatory, if you like. At the very end of it, Robinson's character says, you know, we're already at war. You know, it's, it is a kind, different kind of war, but we're at war and went around the world. The reaction to it was, of course, German diplomats around the world were campaigning for it not to be shown. Famously in India, I mean, consul in Calcutta tried to get the movie stopped, tried to get it banned, tried to get it, as it's as he said, withdrawn from India. And as it turned out, it was the German consul who had to withdraw from India two weeks later when hmm. the war broke out. You know? mm-hmm. But, you know, this sort of thing happened around the, the world. Ireland, the Irish Republic refused to show it because it was deemed offensive to public morals. I'm not quite sure how. But anyway, it, it was largely d- documentary after all. Mm-hmm. But anyway, it left this whole episode left a legacy of bitterness and suspicion to Rue's episode left a legacy of bitterness and suspicion especially in london and but in the meantime the another line had opened up a line of inquiry had opened up because on the same day that that original letter about colonel eglin had been intercepted in Dundee. Another letter was steamed open by Alexander Jack in Dundee Post Office, and this came from another affair agent who was in Prague in what was then Czechoslovakia, obviously in a very sensitive place in Central Europe. Now, this agent identified himself as one Gustav Rumrich. So, in fact, on the day that MI5 got the information about Colonel Eglin, they also had 
the surname of Agent Crown. They just didn't tell the, oh, the, the, the Colonel Lee. Wow. They knew Rumrich's surname from day one, but they didn't tell them because they were much more concerned about protecting this Czech source, mm -hmm. the source of information from Czechoslovakia, because that's many, many times more important than anything that was happening in New York. Right. Vastly right. more important, given all the history of the time and what was going on in Central Europe. Mm -hmm. So, and what this, the, the, once the case had been broken in the US and the arrests had been taken, undertaken in New York and in in in, in Scotland, the the Czechs also arrested this Gustav Rumery, who turned out to be a chemistry student at the University of Prague. Now he was hoping to supplement his. He was a Sudeten German. Uh, that's obviously the dispute, this disputed territory, and that was handed to Czechoslovakia after the after the First World War and was the object of much Nazi ire. And he was a Sudeten German whose family had fallen on hard times. He and his brother had obviously gone to America and been arrested there. But Gustav Rum was hoping to spy, like his brother, as a means to make money, to supplement his income as a, as a student in, in Prague. It was as simple and banal as that. He revealed under interrogation that he had been given two addresses by his German spy masters to communicate, communicate with as letter breaks between him and his adverse spy masters, mail breaks, if you like. One was Jesse Jordan, one Ken Loch Street, Dundee, Scotland. The other one was a Mrs. Gertrude Brandy in Booterstown, in Dublin, in Ireland. Now, my five began promptly began intercepting mail to that address in Dublin as a result of this tip-off from the Czechs. They began intercepting mail that was passing through Britain on its way to Dublin. And they discovered that this woman, Brandy, was receiving mail, was also a German widow, was receiving mail from the, another Abwehr agent, signing himself codenamed Charles, he was a French officer, clearly, in the French Navy. One of the letters that came in was from Tahiti, of all places, um, hmm. and it was intercepted on its way to Dublin. This man, this Agent Charles, it became rapidly became apparent, was revealing a vast swathe of top-grade intelligence about the French Marine Nationale and, by implication, the Royal Navy, to German spymasters in in, in Bremen, in Germany. This was truly very, very damaging. Now, he was only, they only got on to Agent Charles because of Mary Curran. If we can go back to dear old Mary Curran, we only got on to him because she persuaded the police to actually take the case seriously of Jesse Jordan. And then it was taken to MI5. They took it seriously and put the mail intercept in place only just in the nick of time to catch this letter from Prague. Had they not done that, had Mary Curran not done that, that letter from Prague would have gone through. Jesse would have forwarded it on and the Prague-Bremen contact would have gone on. But Agent Charles, who was revealed by that tip-off from Czechoslovakia, would have gone undetected. And he was revealing vast quantities of intelligence, including the very latest ciphers in use by the Marine Nationale, the French Navy. Now, if the Ger it was said that the German Navy read the signal mobilizing the French fleet, Mediterranean fleet, at the time of Munich crisis, this coded signal was sent out to the Mediterranean fleet. The Germans read it at the same time as the French admiral it was intended for. They were reading it wow. real wow. time. This is, this is deadly serious. Oh, yeah. Not only that, if the French then repeated even a section of a royal si a signal sent to them by their allies, then allies in the Royal Navy, 
that would give the, the Germans a break into Royal Navy codes. Mm -hmm. It was that serious. Thousands of lives were potentially at stake. So the hunt for Charles was a deadly serious one. Mm -hmm. And it all started with a letter steamed open over a kettle in Scotland. However, they, they eventually discovered that he had been to Antwerp on a particular weekend to meet his German spy master, one Erich Pfeiffer, and had handed over at that meeting suitcases full of, literally, suitcases full of drawings of the latest anti-aircraft guns, torpedoes, ciphers, the lot. My gosh. Uh, it, was, it was real gold dust. They never had a source like this anywhere else that, that coming close to this. It was a, that prolific at that point in the war or before the war. So this was deadly serious. They discovered he'd been in Antwerp on that particular weekend. This was discovered from the intercepted mail going to Mrs. Brandy in Dublin. So the Sûreté Belge, the Belgian security police, hoovered up every single hotel registration card for that weekend in Antwerp, sent them to the, the, the Deuxième Bureau in Paris, and they discovered that this man had signed in to the Century Hotel in Antwerp under his own name, Marc Aubert. So they found him. Eventually, they tracked him down to a destroyer in the Mediterranean fleet. He was a junior officer on a quiet Sunday afternoon. They burst into the Dizian Bureau, burst into his cabin and found him, caught him in the act of copying out a new cipher issued wow. to the Marine Nationale. They took him and the girlfriend... It, of course, his motive for spying was the oldest one in the book, keep his mistress in the manner to which she would like <laughs> to become accustomed. Mm -hmm. And he, they, they arrested him and his mistress. The mistress went to jail. He was court-martialed, tied to a stake, and shot. Hmm. And th th but that's not quite where the story ends, because the legacy of bitterness left by Tarou in in uh, in in with his revelations to the press and the book and the movie, coloured relationships between the British and Americans in the early days of the Second World War. There was a there was there was a distrust. You you re see repeatedly in MI5 files talking about relationships with the Americans, you see Taru's name comes up. I keep thinking of Taru. I don't want to pass this on because I'm thinking of Taru. You know, this this legacy of mistrust mm -hmm. colored the early days. So it 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 was a while before that confidence was built that led to the sharing, for example, of the Enigma secret with the missions that went to Bletchley Park in, in the UK and saw first the Sinkoff mission, as it was known, and saw the first Turing Welchman bomb computers working and decrypting German messages. The first two of them in place. That, that took some persuading at the time, and eventually it went to Churchill, who took a decision over the head of the head of MI6 that, yes, we would share the Enigma secret with the Americans. But the lead up to that was the distrust that had been caused by Leon Tarou. Yeah, it was quite a rocky road to get there in the end, but it, yeah. it certainly benefited both countries in the very long run once that relationship was established. Yeah, well, absolutely. And, you know, it, 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 once it was established, it very quickly grew. It flourished very quickly. And it was that's partly down to some of the people who were involved. The Sinkoff mission being one, the people who were involved in that, the four American officers involved in that, were, were they brought with them. A, a, a machine that when they came to Britain, they brought with them a machine to help decode purple Japanese traffic. Mm, right, um, right. And yeah, the, the, one of the very few in existence. And they went home. They didn't have it. They didn't. There have been scurrilous accounts that have suggested that the that the Brits didn't actually give the the Americans the Sinkoff mission a a completed Enigma a complete Enigma machine. In fact, Lon Safford was one of the ones who made that accusation it would have been a bit difficult for the Brits to do it because they didn't capture a complete Enigma machine for another two months. <laughs> All they had was 
what they'd worked out on paper about how the machine worked. The, 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 what Turing and Alan Turing, of course, and Gordon Welchman and others had worked out on paper about how the machine had worked. And they then used that to develop the, the early versions of the bomb decryption computers or machines. And the, 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 part, uh, the Americans went home with a copy of that document. So they were given everything at the time that the Brits had. Afterwards, of course, they would also get get completed a complete enigma. Not, I might add, as portrayed in that awful movie U five seven one. Yes, yeah. So I'll just I'll just nail that particular thing to the mast right away. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah. But there we go. But that's that's. That's the gist of the story. That's how it, it, it and, and from that, you've got this relationship that we have today. It was the beginning. It was that letter passed to Colonel Lee in London in 1938 was the first real uh, proper exchange of intelligence in the series that went on to become what we now call, uh, we're, we're post-war, we call the UK-USA agreement, and we now call the Five Eyes. And it has a bearing on what's happening in the Pacific as well. With them. so you know, it's 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 still with us today. And today, that same intelligence alliance that was formed based on that letter, steamed open over a kettle in Ward Road in Dundee, Ward Road Post Office. That let that, that relationship is today one of the major elements providing real time intelligence that's allowing the 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 Ukrainians. Uh, in a decidedly asymmetric warfare, giving them advantage in that asymmetric warfare because they're getting real-time intelligence, not just from the agency, uh, the various agencies involved, also, as we know, from Elon Musk. But, you know, it, nevertheless, the intelligence that they're getting is coming from that same relationship that was formed then. Always a rocky relationship, the wider Special relationship, as it's called, is always rocky, and and it's not particularly special. All nations have special relationships with others, varying degrees. But the one constant that has underpinned the relationship between America, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and the UK throughout that time has been the intelligence sharing relationship. It is it is transactional to a degree, but it has underpinned that relationship. And it continues to this day. That's yeah, that's such incredible stuff. That one fateful decision, what was that, eighty, almost eighty years ago now? Mm, and it really indeed. set the tone for everything to come. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's it's and we're still living with it today. Yeah. Yeah. What a story. What an amazing story that is. So I do have one question that has kind of been, I don't know if I'd say bothering me, but it's been in my mind with a lot of these books that I've read about intelligence and counterintelligence in World War II and, and before World War II as well. And it seems like the German Germany had very, very little success with their foreign intelligence operations in the United Kingdom and in the United States. This was a big, expensive operation that produced almost nothing for them. And, you know, I know that during the war, there was the double cross system and that was so effective in the United Kingdom. Mm. So yes, indeed. Do, can you speculate or, or can you can you give an explanation of why they were so poorly equipped for this kind of foreign intelligence operation when they were otherwise very capable at like the counter espionage and occupied France and in Germany and that sort of thing? Well, yes. One of the reasons is that the German intelligence service that existed up to 1918 to the defeat of Germany in 1918 was disbanded after the war. It was it was broken up. There was a very small cell remained in the German high command in the years following the Second World War, but it was very small. They, this is in sharp contrast to, say, for example, the British, who, have, who had a long history, a very long history of intelligence operations, military and political intelligence operations, you know, famously all the way back to Queen Elizabeth I and beyond. But they, they so... The, the, the Germans did not have this long tradition and long experience. They, they had been a, a major break in their intelligence operations, whereas the Brits had had this constantly going right the way through and had been dealing with the other 
country that had kept the other foe that had been kept their intelligence service going very well, the, the Soviets. As I say, Germany just didn't have that continu- continu- con- continuity. They, they, this meant that when Abwehr was expanded in the, the 1930s, after the Nazis came to power, it expanded very rapidly. And it was the, the model they expanded it on was fundamentally flawed. Hmm. Um, they recruited a lot of personnel who were either old dugouts from during the First World War, who had very out-of-date methods, or they were uh, uh, intellectually ill-suited, shall we say, to the <laughs> task they were required to do. In other words, useless. And they, they, they recruited a lot of very questionable people. Jesse Jordan, spymaster, is a case in point. Hilmar Dirks had worked in German intelligence during the First World War, but spent the intervening years until 1935 as a second-hand car salesman. And his methodology was stuck somewhere about 1912. So that's why he was his agents were so vulnerable. And so, and the other thing was that a lot of these people that were recruited into Abwehr, it was a lovely sinecure. They had a generous expense account. They didn't have to do you know anything unpleasant like fighting anyone. They had nice offices, attractive secretaries. Erich Pfeiffer, this Bremen spy master who ran Marco Bear at Case in Point, he split from his wife during this period as an Abwehr officer and had a long affair with the secretary. I had a generous expense account, liked to take agents who visited him, like Ignaz Griebel, to the top nightclubs in in Bremen and Hamburg. You know, he had a good life. Um, but he didn't have to do very much to keep a, keep his good life. And what they did do was they would get these dribs and drabs of useless intelligence in from agents like Jesse George. Jesse, for example, one of her targets was the Naval Armaments Depot at Crombie on the Forth, River Forth, next to Resyth Naval Dockyard. The Naval Armaments Depot is where they keep all the stuff that goes bang. And that very secret, very sensitive establishment, she stood and scribbled the sketch of this place down and sent it off to Hamburg. Now, the sketch is a useless doodle. We actually have a copy of it in the book. It's a completely useless doodle. Mm-hmm. The same buildings that you see on the sketch are featured on an or, a, 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 you know, a, a, a map any civilian could buy, what's called an Ordnance Survey map in the UK. And you know these buildings are there. She just sketched them down, sent them off, thought she'd done something wonderful. And the spymaster concerned, Hilmar Dirks, again, dressed that up and would send it on to Berlin, dressed up as he has received intelligence on tank farms and other installations around Rosyth Naval Dockyard from one of his agents. Now, this sounds good, but it was actually useless, completely useless. So, you know, this is this is what they were doing. And they were, they were, they were getting themselves a sinecure. And there was no oversight. That was the other thing that was wrong with, with, with Abwehr. There was really nothing like enough oversight of individual Abwehr outstations operations. They could go off and do, as they frequently did, for example, Hamburg and Bremen, the two Abwehr outstations in Hamburg and Bremen, were targeting the same targets in the US and UK. They were both spying in the US and UK, and they were both using the same couriers, which was Incredibly stupid because you take, you get capture one courier as they did in the case of Joanna Hoffman, then you break any everything that the two two outstations the two Abwehr outstations are running because this agent is working for both, um, and you would get agents coming back from say the U.S. and they would they would sell the same piece of intelligence to two separate spy masters. And get paid twice for it. This sort of thing was going on. It was there was no proper management. There was two. There were Abwehr was had too many roles across espionage and counter espionage. It had a very unhappy relationship with the Nazi Party, and in particular, the the Gestapo and the Sicherheitsdienst, the 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 German Nazi Party's own security organization. It was in an invidious position because of that. 
And it just, you know, it was, it was very badly run. It was just very badly run. Wow. Wow. It's amazing stuff. And that's, that really was a, a tremendous factor in at least the intelligence portion of the war there. Those, those poor decisions really had terrible consequences for them over the next few years, certainly. Yeah, I, I, I think it did. And, and, you know, we always, you know, we, we, those of us who've study these things you know we start out with this sometimes with this image of Canaris the head of Abwehr Admiral Canaris is this you know en enigmatic figure you know a, 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 a super spy you know and all the rest of it sadly really his organization was failing under him that's the the bottom line mm -hmm. it was failing rapidly and of course in 1943 it was effectively wound up and absorbed uh, by the Nazi party. Hmm. And then Canaris himself ended up executed at Flossenburg just a few days before the end of the war. And dear old uh, Erich Pfeiffer, of course, he ended up trying to offer his services to the Allies. So, you know, that was the level of... That right, was that was a new chapter and a, and a whole new story there as well. Yeah, it? yeah. Well, you could pick this one up and run with it from here on, you know, but we had to we had to stop somewhere. <laughs> right, right, absolutely. Well, Andrew, this has been really fascinating. I, like I said, I, I loved your book, and there, there are so many things in the book that we haven't had a chance to cover today. So I encourage everybody who's listening to pick up this book, A Taste for Treason by Andrew Jeffrey. It's a really, really interesting look at intelligence in pre-World War II Europe and in the United States. And there are so many stories, like I said, that we haven't been able to cover here, but it's fascinating stuff. So Andrew, are you working on another book at the moment? I'm I'm, I'm in recovery mode at the moment, <laughs> Justin. You know, you've earned yeah, it. Yeah, so I've much. got I've got a couple of ideas kicking around. Let's just say that, but uh, you know, if I tell you, I've got to shoot you. So, oh yeah. <laughs> so, you know, um, it, I I always ask my guests this question, and only about twenty percent of them ever give me a straight answer. So <laughs> yes. far, there are a couple of ideas, but uh, yeah, we'll see how it develops. I'm just chewing them over at the moment to see if we can make of them. Good. Well, I, um, I certainly look forward to it after reading this one. Great, great. So, Thank Andrew, is there much. a place that people can connect with you? Do you have like an online presence, a uh, social media? Uh, I've got a Twitter feed. Yeah, I've got a Twitter feed and a Facebook page. I'm not, I'm, I'm not wonderful at social media. I must be honest. But yeah, it's on. It, it, we're on Twitter and and Facebook. And I'll try. I, I promise I'll put some more stuff up, some more photographs and images of some of the characters and some of the background on them. I'll, I'll stick some more of that on over the next few days. Great, great, great. Yeah, we, we certainly need, honestly, more of this type of content on the social media sites. I, I follow a number of people like yourself on Twitter, and, and there's always a room for more. Honestly, it's a lot yeah. of really good stories out there. And I'd like to see a little bit more of this getting out there to where the people really are, you know, the people that aren't already listening to this podcast or, or reading yeah. your book, because it's, it's really interesting stuff, certainly. Yeah, great stuff. Well, thank you so much, Andrew. This has been a great talk, and I look forward to whatever else you're working on in the near future. Great. Okay, Justin. Thanks All very right, much. Thank you. Take care. Cheers. If you've enjoyed this episode and you want to read Andrew's book, A Taste for Treason, I'll send you a PDF of the book's preface and first chapter completely for free. Just follow the link in the show notes to get your own copy and dive into this story in even more depth. And if you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my pages on Instagram, at Spycraft 101, and at cold.war.stamps. You can also find more great articles on my website, spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there's lots more to come. Disclaimer. This podcast is for entertainment purposes only. The stories and statements expressed herein are experiences and opinions. They may not reflect the views of the host or the production studio. It's okay if you disagree with our content. No piece of media is right for everyone. If you love Spycraft 101, please check us out online, on Instagram, on YouTube, and especially on Patreon. Thank you for listening.